Hi, I did want to uh, introduce myself. I wanted to say hello and uh, can I take this out? Okay. I want to just say hello and say that I'm Ken Epstein. Um, I'm a social worker. I'm the middle generation of three generations of social workers. Um, my daughter is a licensed social worker in a school in San Francisco. I'm white. Uh, I'm 64. I'm from New York, and given that I have very little time, I'm going to speak like New York fast today. Um, and I say all of that um, because everything I say today comes from my bias, like who I am uh, and um, represents how I say things. And so um, I don't want to represent what I'm saying as fact. Um, I want to represent what I'm saying as my experience and also coming from the world according to Ken. The world according to Ken is about um, 40 years working in children, youth, and families. Um, ending um, in the public system as working uh, in the Department of Public Health, um, running uh, children, youth, and families for San Francisco, um, the Medi-Cal system for San Francisco. And since then, I've, um, and there I had the honor and opportunity to be the architect of what we call tra trauma-informed systems. But today I want to talk to you about um, a piece of that because I don't have, you know, a ton of time. And I really wanted to start with um, my gratitude. Um, you know, we've been through collectively so much in the last two and a half years. And I know that each and every one of you as leaders, as students, as parents, um, have sacrificed so much, um, given so much, had so much loss. And I just wanted to spend a moment and uh, actually have all of you applaud yourselves for what we've been through and what you've done in the last two and a half years. I've sat aside and not being a leader, um, I've never been a leader during the pandemic. I have no idea about that. And many of you have and have been through it. And I just want to thank you for what you've done. OK, it's called connecting. I know you had a lot of words um, yesterday about the work you do. Um, and you had connecting and relationships and so forth. And the question is, are we doing this with each other? Are we doing this in every meeting? Are we doing this in every Zoom? Are we doing this in every room? Are we doing this in every place? Because if we're not, we're not embedding and embodying what we're doing into our organizations and into our practice. We have to live and breathe the words we're talking about these days. So if that was connecting and you met somebody you didn't know, I think that's great. If you found out something you didn't know. And the question is also important, because I didn't ask how are you. Um, how are you holding up assumes that maybe something's going on and allows you to decide whether you want to tell it. So I want to start by reading something to you. Um, Congress recall, responded to the call for change and funded an initiative to demonstrate the development of better functioning service systems. This effort led to the National Institute of Mental Health to develop the child and adolescent service system. This program start, supports states in the development of interagency efforts to improve the systems under which the most troubled children and youth receive service. When was that written? 1986. But 1955 would have been possible, too. <laughs> yeah. And I read that because that was the original um, paper. Many of you know, if you're dinosaurs like me in the system, that that was written when we est initially established the system of care. And I just want to talk today about, you know, we have made a ton of progress, a ton of progress. I don't feel depressed by where we are in 2022 by saying, oh, we haven't made any progress. We've made a ton of progress. But I want to talk to you about some things that have gotten the ways of our progress and why it is and what it is we need to consider along the way. So let's start with wiring. Um, I think yesterday you talked about neurobiology and the wiring of our brains. I want to talk to you about the wiring of another system. It's called the system of care. Okay, I want to talk to you about the neurobiology, if we can call it that, of the system of care. And it does not mean when I say this that there aren't exceptions to it, but I want to say the way it's wired. It's built in silos. The funding is designed 
to not cooperate with each other. Our systems are designed to not be funded together. Our agencies are designed to create criteria that does not allow us to work together because we need to accept or not accept children based on their, their availability or their accessibility to our systems or their eligibility to our systems. Our system is designed to create us versus them. We need to, fu we need to fight for the funding from one system to another. San Francisco, my city, went into a, a hiring extravaganza in the Department of Public Health because there were one third of the, of the system um, was absent. But in that hiring extravaganza, they, they took employees from our nonprofits, from HSA, and from other places. So one gap created another gap. When you solve problems by creating us versus them, you move the problem somewhere else. That's wired. It's individualized as opposed to family-centered. We talk about family-centered work, but our diagnoses, our systems, are designed to deal with individuals. We don't effectively engage families in planning. Though we have systems that do that, we fail over and over again to make one family one plan. We give families multiple case managers, multiple places to go, and then blame them when they can't show up to the place that they need to be because they have too much to do. It's wellness is outsourced. We tell people and refer people to other places, but where they show up, they can't get the wellness they need. It's reactive. There's no time. If you wanted to create a system that wasn't going to change, you know what you would do? You would take all the time away. So all the employees would tell you and all the staff would tell you, I have no time for that. Perfect, because if you don't have time, there will not be change. It's wired that way. The workforce is transitional and depleted now, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And policies and practices and universities are a world apart. Practices are developed and evidence is created, and the system cannot implement that evidence because it does not have the infrastructure to, have to implement it. People leave, and we can't do it. And policies, uh, policies and practices and systems are wired to be different. Data is used as a hammer as opposed to a helper. You need to do this because the data says, which tells me I'm doing something wrong, as opposed to data being a helper to improve my job and seeing data as a way of moving forward and improving services. And we are compliance and risk organized. And I could go on, but this is the wiring of the system. And all of you and breaking barriers are actually breaking this wiring. That's what you're doing. That's why I'm so optimistic. But I also want to say, this is what we need to do each day. It's intentional. Because if you don't do it, if you leave bureaucracies alone, bureaucracies will be inhumane. OK? Bureaucracies left alone will be inhumane. It takes intentional practices of leaders and, and parents and students and children and youth to actually, uh, to actually push back on this wiring. And all of this happened before the pandemic. This was not the pandemic. It happened while we were, you know, what, before we were having our, our racial and political reckoning. Increased environmental dangers, like droughts and fires. The most recent war in Ukraine. Political backlash related to trans people, abortion, increased hate towards Asian people, xenophobia, anti-immigrant practices and policies, and racism increasing across our country. Before the last two and a half years, our system was wired in this way. So what I specifically want to talk about today in the bit of time that I have so I want to talk about our workforce. I have the opportunity since I left. I, I guess we were just talking about, um, you know, I retired from the system of care, but I call it preferment. I'm now doing what I prefer to do. Um, um, uh, Maureen said, you know, she's doing what she's wired to do, but I uh, um, rewired to do. So, um, so I have this opportunity to hear people across the country now um, as I do organizational consulting work. 
And this is what I hear. You know this, but I want to say it, because when I give a few recommendations about how we can enhance and create, and so that in 2046, somebody is not quoting 2022 about our efforts and saying, why didn't it happen? Because we have an opportunity. Our youth are telling us we have to. Our parents are telling us we have to. Our, our, our staff are telling us that we have to. We have an imperative. And why not now? But what I hear across the country is people are exhausted, depleted, rageful. Um, there's increasingly more acuity among the staff and the workforce and the folks we work with. People are isolated. It's important to applaud our heroes that are working in the workforce, but they often do not feel heard. Applause is not enough. The supply chain shortage is not about widgets. Let's forget about widgets. The supply chain shortage is about the people that are helping the people that need help. And our supply chain is at critical juncture. Social workers don't want to social work. Teachers don't want to teach. Nurses don't want to nurse. You know, this is not, um, this is not being talked about enough and understood enough and recognized enough. It's at a critical juncture. My daughter, a new social worker in the system, gets a pink slip in her first year, right? Which is reneged, but why is it part of the system that you get a pink slip when your eyes are wide open and you're working in the, in the school system? And I'm not blaming the school system that she works in. It's the way things work. You do this. We have to change it. Breaking barriers has been talking about this for a long time. These are the barriers. They're not just the barriers of can we, can we work together better or differently. The barriers are built into our system. They're wired into our system. So let me, let me just say a couple of things that I think in the world according to Ken, which is not the world necessarily according to anyone else, that I think is important to consider. First, yeah, I was introduced as somebody who um, has um, um, championed trauma-informed and trauma-informed systems and care. And um, trauma-informed is really just a railway system, meaning it's a stop to getting somewhere. Trauma-informed is not an outcome. The outcome is healing organizations and healing systems. Because without well systems, if our workforce is unwell and our systems are unwell, how can we go out and make our communities well? And it doesn't mean we have to wait till our systems get well to help our communities get well, but it does mean we damn well will be, better be working on getting our systems well and stop, stop putting wellness as something we refer to the EAP. Wellness needs to be organizational care. It needs to be embedded and embodied into our organizations. That's what being trauma-informed is. The second thing I want to say about trauma-informed is there is no trauma-informed without racial equity. Um, there is racial equity without trauma-informed because racial equity is trauma-informed. So when we have initiatives in our organizations and we have different organizations working on different things in different parts of organizations, we are by, by nature splitting out the human and relational components of change in our organizations. If you are working on racial equity, you are working on being trauma-informed. So centering racial equity means organizational culture change. And organizational culture change requires leadership engagement. So the second thing I want to say is to the leaders in the room, you have incredibly hard jobs. I know that. Um, they're impossible. They've gotten more impossible. Um, and it seems almost um, contrary to possibility to say you need to create space and time and spaciousness in your worlds. It almost seems like, how the hell could you do that? And I would say, if you don't create time, you won't be able to foster change, and you won't be able to promote change in your organizations. So leadership engagement is a key. People need to see you at the training, not on your device, you know, not, not on your device, not on, not on, not multitasking, but staff need to see you 
when you have an initiative or you're doing something, they need to see you present, eyes wide open, there because they watch you every moment. The second thing is relational leadership is a key. Now, I often refer to transactional versus relational. We're in a transactional system. And I mean by that is our transactional system means that we are always transacting. We are always trying to create something for something. We need to get something to give something. We need to meet a certain criteria to get something. The data tells us we need to get this. The audit needs to, tells us we need to get that. It's important. Um, it's not sufficient. Transactional can't trump relational. Because relational means that you're doing three important things and it's embedded and embodied in the system. I call it the three C's. The first C is connection. What we did with how are you holding up? But how are we building connection into every aspect of our organization, every email, every text, every conversation? Are we first centering, am I connected with the people I'm talking to? Or am I just talking to them because I don't have time to connect? We are in the business of connection. The, this, the, research, the research on psychotherapy, the research on psychotherapy tells us that 60 to 80 percent of change happens from the relationship I have with somebody else. That's not rocket science. So why do we spend 20, you know, 100 percent of ourselves teaching skills? I mean, skills are important. But if 60 or 80 percent of change is about the relationship, shouldn't we be centering connection if that's what's going to change? You all know this, but there's no time for it. I understand because I didn't have time for it. I'm not holier than thou. I did not center connection. I could admit the emails that I sent at 4.30 in the morning that, not, that were not very um, relational because I was really stressed and I wanted to go out for my run and I wanted to tell everybody what they needed to do at 4.30 in the morning. And then they told me that they didn't like those emails at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> you ever get that email? Yeah. You know, or maybe you're the 12 o'clock at night emailer. Yeah, they don't like those either. They're not connecting. Yeah. I've made every one of these mistakes. I'm not holier than thou, but I get to be, you know, in my preferment and look back and say, oh, my God, why did I do that? So, so the, the idea of the first C is connection. How do you embed it into your, embody it, embed it into your meetings, into your emails, into your texts? Into, every, into your budgets? How do you communicate in ways that have connection? The second C is coherence. Now, coherence is important, and even think about coherence now in the last couple of years. Um, it has been so confusing, unpredictable. Um, we don't know which policy or procedure. There's masks, there's no masks. Vaccines, no vaccines. Available, not. Um, we can go out, we can't go out. Um, coherence is important, and coherence means you have to listen, and you have to hear what people are saying, and then repeat it back. Is this what you said? And make sure that people get it, because the story is complicated and confusing. And when we give initiatives and policies and procedures and new ideas, it doesn't necessarily make sense to people, because it makes sense to us. So coherence is the second C. The third C is about collaboration, and that, that has uh, included in it, inclusion. Um, so if we're going to make change, we have to have collaboration and inclusion. And that means we have to build um, relationships throughout our organizations of people that align with that change and let that change grow through a growing collaboration. So you know, the question you can ask yourself around everything you do is, I, am I building and incorporating the three Cs? And now I want to talk to you about four more initials because I'm big on initials. I call it the four R's. What do we do about our workforce? Um, from a trauma-informed and racial equity perspective, our workforce is hurting and unwell. Well, the first thing I would do is I would collectively recognize, not acknowledge, but recognize that they're depleted, exhausted, rageful, 
and we have a shortage of staff. It has to be recognized at every level and we have to fight for it. We have to fight for recognition because it's crazy making if I'm not told that what I'm feeling is true. If I'm told I'm depleted, rageful, and exhausted, but here's another job to do because there's only a third of the staff that's here. So here's two more jobs to do. I know you're exhausted, but work harder. We have to recognize. And recognition is not acknowledgement. I know it's really hard. Recognize is hearing it. It doesn't mean you need to change anything, but you have to recognize and hear. That's the first R, because you can't repair what you don't recognize. And at the highest levels of the state, please tell, the, for those of you that are connected to the highest levels of the state, it'd be so important if people just got out and said, I know, you're unwell. Because we are unwell. The second one is repair. Um, you can repair what you recognize. And when you repair, you have to have a process of repair. Um, you can have, you know, you can have healing circles in organizations. You can have wellness embedded in organizations. It doesn't mean that EAPs and mindfulness and self-care is not important. But the self, the self knows that it needs to care for the self. Telling me I need more self-care does not mean I want, don't want to eat bonbons and watch Netflix all night. All right. It doesn't mean that I, I that I can take care. I'll I'll make those decisions. We need to embed it into our organizations and have spaces and places where people can repair, and get well and feel heard. And then we can move to reconciliation because then we need to look at our policies and procedures, and see where our policies and procedures are continuing to harm the people in our organization, and particularly the procedures. Is what we're doing harming? the people in our organization, and can we shift that? And then we can think about restoration um, and beginning to move forward. But we need to do something about the, the state of our workforce. The last thing I want to say is about time. Um, there is no time. There's no time to do anything I just said. You don't have time to do it. You don't have time to embed it. You don't have time to repair. You don't have time to heal. Um, I know that because I didn't have time. So creating time is revolutionary. Creating time is revolutionary. I mean, so the question is, I had a half an hour, I created two minutes for you to talk to each other. I gave up two minutes of my precious talk, but I think your two minutes of talking to each other was much more important than my precious talk. So I'd ask you all to think about the time and how time is spent in your organizations um, and where you can create spaciousness and reflective space so that change can take place. Because today, and breaking barriers, I read through your incredible agenda, and you're going to hear incredible presentations about people that took time and space to make changes. And there was a lot of sacrifice to do that. But the only way it's going to change is if you actually take, take the time as leaders, as people, to figure out how you can embed time into your organizations, create spaciousness in meetings, create times to reflect. And with that, I will stop and tell you thank you, and I appreciate your time today. Yeah.